Hello and welcome to our sixth lecture on Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics, where we'll be covering the circumstantial verb. And I promise we will move on eventually. We are still in chapters one through four of Hoke. He goes over a lot and I want to go over the stuff he says in a lot of detail because it is very important to understand and not to gloss over for our purposes later as we move forward. Right now we are going to begin covering verbs. We're going to cover the parts of verbs that are discussed in chapters one through four, uh, as well as like the structure of verbal sentences and other things that are tied in with the circumstantial verb. Note that these are the absolute basics. Verbs get a lot more complicated very quickly, as we're going to see um, once we move on from chapters one through four, which will probably be after the next two videos. So seven and eight will probably be about one through four, and then we'll move on to eight. Uh, yeah, move on to nine, and that'll be chapter five. Uh, we'll we'll get to see the infinitive, uh, which is where verbs start getting all fun and complicated. But for now, we get the nice, relatively easy circumstantial. It has its difficulties, as we'll find out. Uh, verbs are classified according to root, and by this I mean uh, the the word of the verb itself, the base word. There are five broad categories of roots based on the number of consonants and the type of consonants that are in the word. Now, there are other forms, other, other root types, um, that we're not going to get into now because they're just not super common, and some of them don't have a huge impact on the verb. Hope covers them at the end. I think I probably will too if I, <laughs> if I make these videos for long enough to cover the entire textbook. I will probably probably go over them, but for now we can pretend that there are five basic categories of verbs and a very small number of irregular ones added in. The basic form of the root is the triconsonantal. If you know your Semitic languages, you know most roots have three consonants. Um, and this is true in Egyptian as well. Most words are three consonants long, especially the verbs. The last consonant in a true triconsonantal root has to be strong. So that means no W, no I, and no Y. Those are our weak consonants. That'll be important later. Uh, the e canonical example is this word, which is sejem. Um, the ear is a triconsonantal, uh, triconsonantal hieroglyph. Is S, Janja, M, and then followed by an owl as a phonetic complement. It means to hear. We're going to use it in our example sentences quite a bit, and you'll see it in conjugation. You know, Sejimaf is he hears, as we'll find out soon. Then you have your biconsonantal roots, and those are not all that different from the triconsonantal roots, except, as the name would suggest, they have two consonants. So, for example, you have the word jed, meaning to speak, a very common word, so it's good to use as our paradigm. Uh, comes up a lot, and it's also the logical complement of sejem to hear, so you get that little added bonus. Third weak roots are triconsonantal, but the final consonant is either i, y, or w. And in a lot of verb forms, that i, y, or w will tend to fall off, uh, won't be written. Maybe it's superseded by another stronger consonant. Um, you know, things, things like that, we we'll cover them individually. This doesn't really happen in the circumstantial, but it does happen in later forms, so it's important to know. This verb also that I've listed here is very important to know. It is the verb iri, and it means to do. You know what they didn't bother writing the I? We know it's there from other things, from the way it behaves, but iri is written as though it was just ir, but that, that second r actually appears, if I remember correctly, pretty much only when the I would appear, and then it's just ear otherwise. Again, more on that later, but just so you're aware. You can also have fourth weak roots. Same deal, except there are four consonants. Uh, they, they tend to change in the same way as the third weak, where that final consonant tends to get dropped or replaced. And here's a good example. It is hemsi. It means to sit. Dotted H-M-S-I. Uh, that almost like a bathtub thing. That's the biconsonantal uh, hieroglyph, the biliteral for hem, dotted H M. And then at the very end, that's a, a man who is um, pointing his hands at the ground. 
as the determinant for sitting. And then you have a final category of roots called the third geminate. And that's when the last consonant is repeated, as in this verb, kebeb, to be cool, Q-B-B. -B. Now, what's interesting about this is, uh, in the Semitic languages, geminate is when two letters appear right next to each other, and it's like pronounced longer. That's not what's happening here. This verb in Middle Egyptian was, let's say the vowel was E, it would be kebeb. But the reason this has bearing on the writing of the language and on the verbs is that in some verb forms, the second consonant or the second vowel will get dropped or moved. Um, so this verb might become kebe, uh, where sejme would become sejme, the two b's would kind of merge into one. And the Egyptians in those cases would only write one b. So sometimes these verbs will change and they can be an important marker for where tense is changing and that kind of thing. Egyptian verbs are organized not like in English, where they tend to be divided up by tense, voice, and mood, but by form. Uh, form meaning probably how the vowels were arranged and certainly the grammatical function of the verb in the sentence. Uh, to give an example, there are different forms that each have active and passive versions or past and present versions. Uh, it's all about the role in a sentence and how the meaning is colored by the form. The most basic form, the one we're going to be discussing today in a little bit of detail, is the circumstantial. It is the most basic Egyptian verb form. It's the, the default, the dictionary form. It, it behaves like a main verb. Uh, it, it acts like it is in that, you know, it'll, it'll take a subject and it will dominate a sentence or clause, that kind of thing. But it fundamentally operates like an adverb. It's, it's a little weird. We're going to do a little more on this later. But basically, a clause made with a circumstantial is modifying something. And that something is either another clause or it's modifying you, which means here and now. Uh, so here and now, there is and then the thing that the circumstantial clause is saying. Although it's perfectly simple to just translate this as a simple statement of fact in English. The grammar in Egyptian is a little tricky, on a theoretical level at least. Uh, the primary use of the circumstantial is as the main verb in a statement of fact. Uh, so you, know, you have your you that introduces a statement of fact about the here and now, and then a sentence containing a verb in the circumstantial. It's also used as the main verb in dependent clauses of circumstance. Uh, meaning while this was going on, something else was going on, or before this happened, this happened, or after this happened, this happened. Things like that, uh, the so-called circumstantial clauses. We've already learned about these sorts of clauses before when we were discussing sentence structure. This is where you, you can also have them with verbs. And as with the nonverbal forms, they are not preceded by you. And the circumstantial when it wants to take a subject, it takes either a noun, just take, put directly after the verb, or a suffix pronoun, put directly after the verb as its subject. The most basic form is the circumstantial sejimaf. Uh, so the, our paradigm verb is sejim. You would affix a suffix pronoun as the subject. F, so you get sejimaf. It is the present active form of the verb, the relative present. That is to say, if I have a main clause, that's in the past. And the circumstantial sejimaf is in a circumstantial clause that is also in the past, but is not at the same time in the past as the other one. It's the dictionary form of the verb, no change in any root type. And here is a very, very basic sentence. You sejimaf we, which is just he hears me, uh, where we is our direct object, which requires a dependent pronoun, and sejimaf is our verb, and then we, of course, have you. And here I've put that, taken that same sentence and put it in the past using a form known as the circumstantial sejim nf. The n infix between the the, either the suffix pronoun or the nominal subject and the verb puts it in the past active. And that's really the only difference. So you sejim nf we would be he heard me rather than he hears me, but otherwise the same. There's also 
passive forms of the circumstantial. Uh, remember the passive in, in English would be something like is heard or something like that rather than hears. If you're lucky, doesn't happen a lot, the Egyptians will put in a marker for the passive. In the present, that marker is two, T-W, sometimes T. Uh, there's also a preposition that tends to show up a lot in these sort of sentences, which is the preposition in, which means by. So in this case, you sejim tu f in we would be he is heard by me, which reverses the original meaning, in which case I am the hearer and he the speaker. And then the past also has its own passive form, the sejimu f, the w. Uh, it's append the w is appended to the end of the verb, not at really an infix as with the n. Uh, the w is not always written. And this one does have a few other indicators. Those third geminate forms do not geminate, and the weak verbs drop that final vowel consonant, uh, that i or y or w. And then again, using that same sentence with that uncommon marker, uh, we have you sejmu sejmuf in we, so he was heard by me. Broad overview of the verbal sentence. It's very similar to the nonverbal sentence. Uh, starts with your your particle, which is usually you. And then we have the verb, the subject, the object, and the adverbial comment. And note that word order. The verb comes before the subject and the object, and the subject is going to come before the object. And then you put your adverbial comment after all that main information. And the so-called adverbial comment can include like dependent clauses and that kind of thing. This is what is meant, by the way, when it is said that uh, the circumstantial is in adverbial form. Because clauses formed by the circumstantial can sit in the adverbial comment. So grammatically, it's an adverb. You can also do something in Middle Egyptian called topic fronting. Uh, it's a way of emphasizing the logical topic of the sentence, the thing being talked about. You can do so either just by slapping topic at the topic at the front or by using you and then the topic. Uh, in either case, you need to put in a suffix pronoun that agrees with that topic after the verb uh, so that it kind of becomes the grammatical subject effectively and the topic is allowed to be a suffix pronoun and this adds emphasis basically that's the point of it uh, so it's not he hears me but it is he who hears me something like that you know, really calling attention to a particular fact uh, it is not necessary to translate it like this, but it is important to be aware of why this can happen. This is all you need to understand the basics of chapters 1 through 4. I'm going to do an additional video where I go over some other, like, more minor points uh, that I did not cover yet that I still think are important to talk about, and then we'll go over some examples after that. Uh, and as always, stick around after this point for the biliterals. So the, the hockey stick is bech, that does have another meaning as well. Um, pech is a flower. I believe that one primarily comes up in a word for strength. Mech, not to be confused with the tongue. Uh, the tongue is ness. Um, but not still important to remember. Uh, nech, mostly used, I think, in the word for eternity. Um, if I remember correctly, or... No, perhaps not. Eternity is ha. There was a mistake on my part, but that is an, an eagle that is neck. Note that little thing coming off of its chest. That's how you'll differentiate it. There's only one notable biliteral with a final circle H, um, which is just ach, alef, chet. And then for those with final S, you have the book, is. Uh, more commonly, it's a determinative, but it does occasionally take that phonetic value. Mess, which means son of, and occasionally has like connotations of birth and that kind of thing, uh, is this rather abstract floral arrangement. Ness uh, is the tongue hieroglyph. Again, don't confuse that one with mech. Uh, note that this one is 
is like a stick figure drawing almost, and the other one has some internal lines to it. Ches doesn't come up a lot, as I recall, but important to know. Shes is a, a knotted rope, and note that it's upside down compared to the Shen hieroglyph, uh, which we covered in the previous video. Guess uh, is either of these two. The one on the right is always guess. The other one can occasionally mean other things. And then we have two one-ofs. Uh, with final Q, you have this, this duck with its neck kind of craned back. Ak. And then Sek has its own hieroglyph, which is the knotted cord with a little horizon symbol on top of it. And that's basically all for this lecture. Uh, and hope to see you in the next one.